Hello, and welcome to this eCampus News webinar, using mass notification to help your campus prepare for the new normal. My name is Chris Hobson, and I am the custom content manager for eCampus News. And I'm excited to have you join us for what should be a very informative session. Today's webinar is sponsored by SingleWire Software. SingleWire Software is a developer of InformaCast, a leading software solution for fast and reliable emergency notifications. More than 7,000 organizations in over 50 countries use InformaCast for emergency mass notifications. Before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to take a minute to go over some features of the platform that we're using for this webinar. Today's event will be recorded, so you don't have to worry about missing a thing. Within a few days, you'll receive an email message that contains a link to the recorded webinar along with a PDF of the slides. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on the Q&A box. There will be time at the end of the presentation for our speaker to address questions. Also, there is a group chat function that you can launch by clicking on chat. Feel free to use this feature to contact someone from eCampus News if you have a technical question, but please don't use this feature to ask questions of our speaker. If you have a question for the speaker, you can use the Q&A box that I just mentioned. With these housekeeping items out of the way, let's get started with our presentation. The presenter today is Pat Sheckel, Executive Vice President of Product Management for Single Wire Software. Pat has more than 15 years of experience helping organizations across a wide range of industries implement tools that enhance safety and communication. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to Pat to begin the presentation. All right, thank you, Chris. So what we're gonna talk about today are, is what we're seeing out there in terms of mass notification trends, what is actually being sent by our customers. We're gonna look at messages that we have pulled out of the, the message database uh, those have been cleansed of any identifiable information, but they're actual messages. And then we're going to talk about the future notification landscape and how we see things evolving. And we're going to close by talking about how SingWire fits into all of this. So just a little bit of background uh, in Formicast, the product that is the flagship made by SingWire has been around for nearly 20 years now. Uh, we're based in Madison, Wisconsin. And we have about 110 employees. And as Chris mentioned, we have about 7,000 customers. So what are we seeing out there today? Um, you, you can't turn around without seeing coronavirus related news. Uh, here are just a, a few recent snippets. And what we're seeing are, is, is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and we're seeing a real need to get in touch with people wherever they are. Uh, and I'll share a number of, of customer stories and anecdotes as we go along, really underscoring that, how we're seeing people message a lot more and message different things than they had in the past. Uh, but it all comes back to one thing, and that is having an effective notification system gives you the flexibility to reach your people wherever they are and to be able to change and address those issues as they evolve. So issues that may be facing you today, and certainly that we're seeing in a lot of our customers, and in, in, uh, in our communities is that workers are falling sick. Um, and that has ramifications uh, much more than it, it does in a typical year. And, and the reason for that is, uh, is really because of, uh, because the, this, can, this can spread and, and you can shut down an entire organization or at least a facility um, if left unchecked, right? So you're seeing things change in terms of uh, what people can do relative to childcare, you're seeing things change relative to masking policies, you're seeing changes happen weekly or sometimes daily. And as a result, people need to communicate in real time and, and share those changes. Uh, for example, um, if a worker falls sick, that can happen at any hour of the day and you need to let the people that are going to report to work know about that you may, if you had reopened and had that office physically staffed, you may need to do a deep clean and have people uh, work remotely for a couple of days. Uh, conversely, many of us uh, are, have continuously worked remotely since this whole thing began. Uh, and if things change, you need to let people know. And we know that things, you know, communication methods like email just aren't all that effective. 
So your regular communication channels are, are challenged. They may not be time sensitive enough. They may not be urgent enough. They may not be intrusive enough. We also know that revenues and budgets are impacted. Certainly in the public sector, we see this because tax collections are down significantly. If you're a municipality, you're counting on <clears throat> tourism related dollars, things like room taxes, gas tax revenue and so forth. Uh, and if you're, if you're in the private sector, you're looking at uncertainty and, and businesses tend to hold on to cash during times of uncertainty um, as, as a means of self preservation. So revenues and budgets are impacted and that matters because later on, we're gonna bring that back around full circle and talk about how Informacast helps you leverage what you already have in your environment. The other thing that we're seeing is that mobile notification is more important than ever especially with two-way communication. So getting a response back, and we'll, we'll see that in some of the customer examples. So we did a survey of our customers. Uh, we also did a survey of the um, mass notification, safety and security consultants that we deal with on a regular basis. And we came up with this quick chart on four ways to improve worker communications. One is by making sure that you have that solid line of communication to your remote workers. Next is by protecting those buildings when they're empty or not as fully staffed. So monitoring what's happening. And third is preparing for reopening. And this is an ebb and flow, at least that we've seen uh, in many places. Uh, and it just depends on your geography. And, and by that, you know, even down to the city level where you may, you may have had um, a lockdown of sorts and then you reopened and you may still be reopened and just fine or you may be one of those places that has experienced a, a surge in the virus and so there have been new government governmental mandates that have come out that have restricted things again and so forth and then the last one is is really pretty important because we're not going to be in this forever but you want to make sure that whatever investments you make during this time when you come out of the other side of the pandemic that those serve you well for your use cases and your business needs at that time so we're seeing that business continuity risk is real. Um, you know, certainly this is, a, this is a variable statement that depends on your industry and your location. We know that retail and hospitality and tourism are exceptionally challenged right now. We know that conditions change rapidly uh, and they'll continue to change rapidly. And we know that communicating with people in real time is really important. Doing health and wellness checks, it can be really helpful. Um, we see that, and again, I'll get to this real quickly here. We're gonna show some actual messages that have been sent. So working with some of our notification people, we took a look at what are some of the best practices that you can implement today um, to merge into the new normal. And, and really what this is, is a gap analysis between the way things were and the way things are, uh, are now and, and will be uh, in the future. So what we're talking about here is first identify conflicts between your new COVID procedures, such as social distancing and masking and so forth, and other safety or disaster recovery related procedures and processes. So just as an example, just think about how you might handle a tornado drill, right? Typically you're going to the interior part of a building and you're huddling in very close quarters against an interior wall. Well, social distancing would suggest that that's not a great idea right now. So do you forego a, a, a tornado drill? Um, do you skip it all together because most people are remote? Uh, or do you do some sort of hybrid where you do people in shifts and that sort of thing? That's just one example, but there are other things um, when you talk about uh, like Alice training or active shooter training, that sort of thing run, hide, fight, and so forth. Do those drills go away? Do you, do you tabletop plan for it, et cetera? The most important thing is that you develop a plan to merge those things, those COVID procedures and your safety processes, and you game plan for, for what could happen. One of those might be someone testing positive and notifying management in a particular location. And this is happening all, all over the place. The grocery store two blocks from my house had a positive case. They shut down for a couple of days for a deep clean and then they reopen. So communicating with people, again, you don't know when you're gonna get that call uh, and you don't know how severe it's gonna be, but you wanna have those, 
those things planned out and you want to have your communication plan ready to go for that. Similarly, you could have a change in governmental directive. We're seeing this happen. If you follow the news at all, you see it happening on a city by city, county by county, state by state, depending on, depending on where you are, um, where things have changed relative to masking policies. Um, places that said, we don't need these, it's not a big deal. Are, many of them are saying, well, now we need it because we want college football in, in a few weeks uh, or for some other reason. But we're, we're seeing that in the news, right? And so then how do you, if, if you go through, let's go back to the positive case for a moment. Someone's tested positive, you shut down, or maybe you don't, depending on the circumstances for a while, but you need to have a way of communicating that to your people, of reassuring them, and of uh, reopening in an orderly fashion. The other thing that we're seeing is that uh, the, the age that we live in, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and some of that is, is planned uh, on certain nefarious parties. And, and in other cases, it's just the product of the age that we live in where everyone is their own, own source of truth. And everyone has a way of communicating that like social media to all of their friends and family. So our job as leaders is to direct people to trusted resources. So if you're telling people to take health and safety measures directing them to a source of truth. And typically what you're going to do is you're going to draw on the, the information from health and safety authorities, make that your organization's source of truth and then point them to that. Uh, and so directing them back to that could be your intranet, uh, could be another source of information inside your organization. So once you've done those first two steps, identify the conflicts, the gap analysis, develop the plan, it's implementing those scenarios into your mass notification platform. So you don't have to think a lot during a time of high stress when one of these cases pops up and you have to take uh, a rapid action. And this is, these steps really have evolved over time and are not new to COVID necessarily, not the plan and practice and implement the mass notification scenarios. Those have been there for severe weather and for active intruder events for years, just modifying it to fit what's happening with the pandemic. So who's authorized to send? What content will they, will they be sending? Who's going to receive it? Is it everybody? Is it a subset? Do you, do you bifurcate that? Everybody gets one message, but your incident response team gets, a sub, gets that message plus a subset of instructions. And then what action do you want them to take? Do you want them to respond? You know, for example, a health and wellness check, yes, I feel fine, or two, I have some sort of symptoms. Uh, in other cases, it's I'm safe or I need help. And then how are you gonna bring the incident management team together to deal with the situation? Sometimes you're gonna send out a notification and it's just informational and that's it. You send it out, it's done. There's no follow-up required. Oftentimes though, it's an ongoing incident and you send out a notification and that's just the start of, the, of dealing with that scenario and you need to manage the ongoing events as they occur. So you get more information back based on maybe the confirmation responses coming back through your mass notification platform. So you see those coming back and you wanna send out a follow-up, maybe one message to the people who responded one way, another message to the people who responded another way so that that message confirmation, escalation, reporting, and then the management of that scenario can be very important as well. And having that planned out in advance and knowing what tool you're going to use, what processes, checklists, et cetera, you're going to use are really important. So just touching, kind of summarizing some of the mass notification trends we're seeing. Mobile is paramount right now. So many people are working from home that it's really important to reach remote workers. That means that in-building notification at this very moment is a little bit less important than it was in the past. Uh, and we do in-building notification very well through a variety of methods. So that's something that, that we certainly care about, but we're no strangers to what's going on. So we're, we're fully, uh, fully admitting that right now it's a little less important, but you do wanna keep that in the back of your mind because we'll exit the pandemic and you wanna have a way to have really effective in-building notifications because you know that mobile won't reach everybody as quickly as you would like to. 
we do see some industries where in-building notification is more important than it was in the past. We're seeing this in hospitality where places are trying to reopen and they're trying to do it very consciously and safely. And so they want to communicate with people on a regular basis, remind them of certain policies, procedures, places they should or shouldn't be, that sort of thing. One of the other things that we're seeing is this, and I'm sure you're experiencing this if you're a knowledge worker and you're, you're on Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Cisco WebEx Teams or any of these other platforms all day, every day. And so this is just a chart showing the, some of the growth from February through the start of June. And you can see just massive growth numbers. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different sources on this. One of them shows Microsoft Teams going up to 75 million daily users, um, trip, really tripling the pre-pandemic daily usage of that tool. And there are others out there. But the point is that you really want to be able to reach people wherever, wherever they are. So if you have a mass notification platform, it should tie into your, your collaboration tool. The other thing, just as an aside that I thought was interesting is that people, a lot of people are re reporting that they're far more fatigued working in collaboration tools and doing video meetings all day than they ever were in face-to-face -face meetings. And I, I've, I found that to be really interesting um, because it <laughs> certainly resonated with my personal experience. Um, so let's transition now. We'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing in, in terms of what our own customers are sending to their end users. So this happened to be a healthcare provider in the Southwest and they're sending out this notification and they're asking their employees before their shift to attest that they are healthy. And at first glance, when I read this, I scratched my head a little bit and I said, well, they're healthcare workers. How, how, if anyone should know that they, you should only go to work if you're healthy, it, it would be them. But you just think about the way things have been in the past. You know, they're, they're scrubbing up all the time. Um, they may not, you know, if they had a little bit of a headache or a sore throat, they would take, maybe take some Tylenol and just show up for work and kind of soldier through it. And they weren't dealing with a highly contagious uh, airborne respiratory virus, right? So now it's just a reminder that, hey, you know, put the, the, the super work ethic to the side. If you have one of these symptoms, you know, don't even think about coming in. Another thing that we're seeing, and this is in a couple of different industries, are regular reminders to sanitize certain areas. And you know, this is, you know, for obvious reasons, and I'm sure you've been places where you can see people actively cleaning around you. Um, I had a friend that did a mortgage closing and before she could even get out of the office, the, the person had come around the other side of the plexiglass and sprayed down everywhere that she had touched. So certainly some places are more diligent about it than others, but it, you know, it's still really important to do. And so you can put a scheduled reminder into our software and, and I'm sure others too where you can just remind, send out a regularly scheduled reminder during certain hours. Um, and in, in our software, a lot of people use this as a bell scheduler. So a lot of K-12 districts run all of their passing bells using our software. So it lends itself very well as something like this, you know, just a regular cleaning reminder. And as I said, if, if you are publishing the source of truth for trusted information, on your internet then sending out a, re a regular notification when something has changed there and redirecting people to that uh, update is important. And one of the reasons you might do this is that update might be rather lengthy and you don't want to send out a text message that gets separated into five or six segments. Uh, and if it's not urgent, you know, then redirecting people to something like this is a, a really clean way to do that. Few other messages that we've seen, people notifying people of the uh, face covering policy changes at their organizations. Um, we had one of those here where there was a county mandate that, and now a state mandate um, that just went into effect that anyone indoors uh, in a common area needs to be masked. So I'm currently sitting in my office with the door closed. I don't have my mask on, but when I leave this door, I will. And so that, and that can be a shift. That's a cultural shift. People forget, you know, so sending out regular reminders is, is good. A couple of healthcare examples here on the next one. We've had, we've had customers 
celebrate the discharge of their patients by playing a song. Uh, in this case, what they're doing is they're having it play over the overhead speakers and out over the, um, the speakers of their desk phones and over their computer desktops um, uh, or laptops through those speakers. And they're triggering this just by hitting uh, a, a function key, a speed dial button on a desk phone uh, in the unit where the discharge is happening. So it's an uplifting story that you know, people are celebrating those successes. And then you can see, as I mentioned earlier, notification of building shut down due to a positive case and then notification that they reopened. We're seeing more of those show up in our database. And then of course, just regular communication updates based on policy changes. And then there's the desktop notification, which pops to the front of all the windows on a, on a Windows or Mac computer and can also automatically play audio at the speakers. So that's a, a really intrusive way of getting in touch with people. So that's what we have seen so far. Now I'm gonna talk a bit about where we see things going in the future. And we really do see a combination of mobile and on-premises uh, as being the future. And, and the reason for that is because there are certain use cases like those listed at the bottom that really are very, very time dependent, um, meaning seconds really matter. Um, you know, active shooter events only usually only last a, a handful of minutes uh, and they, they evolve very quickly. So giving people even a few extra seconds of notification can, can really mean the difference between life and death. Uh, similarly with severe weather, we have manufacturing environments where you have, uh, you have only a few minutes uh, to take shelter when a tornado is bearing down. And in certain work environments where there are no windows, um, having that notification can, can really be important. So the ability to notify people both on their mobile phone and on their desk phone is, is that much more important. We see, we see this, these were important things before the pandemic, they'll be important again. Again, right now at this very moment, mobile is more important than on-premises for, for many of our customers. Uh, and what we're seeing in the future is that there will be more of a balance and that in-building will be very important again. And you know, one of the analogies that we use is that you know, over the years, the industry has evolved to the point where it used to be fire alarm was just a bell and then it became a bell and a strobe light. And now it's those two things and it is the, uh, the ability to uh, have spoken voice, depending on the fire code that's been adopted in your local jurisdiction. So the latest NFPA, uh, National Fire Protection Association guidelines have a spoken voice. And, and the reason they do that is because it's far more effective. Um, you've probably seen the side-by-side -side videos of, of experiments where people have been, when just a fire alarm goes off and they're sitting there eating and nobody moves, but when the fire alarm goes off, and there's a spoken voice saying, fire, fire, move to the nearest exit, this is not a drill, you see a lot more uh, activity. Um, and so you wouldn't send a text message to everyone, only send a text me message to everyone for a fire alarm. You probably wouldn't wanna do that for some of these other scenarios either. Okay, so let's move along here. Let's talk about a few other use cases that we're seeing. So, you know, we're seeing these remote worker notifications be really important. Uh, and again, for so many reasons, um, we have people working odd shifts. We have people here at Single Wire that don't have childcare uh, arrangements the way that they used to, and they have um, both parents working, and they're both trying to work from home. And so, one is working the early shift, and one is working more of a later shift, and they're trying to take care of uh, the children um, and, and split those duties. So you don't know exactly when people might be working. Um, there, there's a lot more split shift or time shift in work. That's one thing. People aren't in the same place. Email isn't effective. So getting a hold of people in real time is, is much more important. There's this need for health advisory. So we had a large bottling manufacturer, um, beverage manufacturer, and they had the need to do a health check and to fast pass people who were attesting they were healthy into one line and to check out other people into another line, people who were not doing that 
who didn't have the code to tell them that, that confirm that they were healthy. And, and the reason they, they went to this is because they were treating everyone as if they were unhealthy at first. And that was, it was taking them too long to start the shift. They were losing up to a half hour at the start of every shift um, because people no longer could just stream into the building. They were you know, doing temperature checks and wellness checks and so forth. And then these, the remaining use cases, active shooter automated weather, panic buttons, et cetera. These are things that, that we have seen in the past that people have come to us for and people will continue to come to us for. Um, we are seeing more of the facilities integration with say temperature sensors. Um, it, will, it used to be and it will be in the future locking, automatically locking doors. We see a lot of that. But internet of things, systems and sensors can be just about anything. In the past, it's been things like ammonia sensors for, for ice cream manufacturers. It's been, um, it's been locking doors that aren't already locked. It's been a, a video surveillance system detecting that there are people in an area where there shouldn't be people and then sending a, an alert, letting them know that that area is being watched and the authorities have been notified. So there's a whole variety of use cases there that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on right now, but those can be really important. Tying into that physical environment in manufacturing, it tends to be things like um, loading dock doors and, and so forth. In, in, uh, in campus, uh, whether it's an education or healthcare campus type environment, tends to be more about people congregating in an area they're not supposed to be or the, the lockdown scenario. So now I'm gonna take you through a little bit of, of product. Um, and then once we're done with that, we'll get to questions. So just talking about our solutions, we have three flavors of solution. I'm gonna talk about two of them, Informacast Mobile and, and Informacast Fusion. Informacast Mobile is really, it's really what, uh, what a lot of people think of when they think of mass notification, which is reaching people on their mobile phones uh, via any of the four main methods that you see there on the right. Um, and the one that's primarily used is bulk SMS text messaging by, by the entire industry because um, most people won't install an application specifically for notifications. Some may, and it's a great experience if you do, but many people don't. Uh, phone calls, because of all the spamming out there, many people don't answer the phone, so that's not timely. And we all know email isn't timely, so really you default to SMS text messaging. And this is what a lot of our competition does. They, they have an offer that looks almost exactly like this. And we do this too, and it's a great entry point. If, however, you start there and want to grow to the point that you can do both mobile and on-premises notification from a single platform very effectively, then that's Informacast Fusion. So you can see the distinction here. Mobile now is, is one quadrant here. We're able to do all the on-premises notification and we, you see desk phones here and we're not calling those, we're broadcasting to them. And there's a big distinction there because we can scale to tens of thousands at once instead of trying to call them, which takes a long time. And as we discussed is not very uh, effective because people aren't answering the phones. We're broadcasting out the speaker of the phone. So effectively turning every desk phone into an emergency notification speaker. That's really how we started. That was the very first version of Informacast. Um, built nearly 20 years ago. We do the same thing with computer desktops and laptops. So we're broadcasting audio out the speakers. We're also sending, uh, we're sending uh, a window that pops to the front of all of your other windows. And then we have the ability to tie into your overhead paging system, whether that is an existing analog paging system, we can reuse that, give it new intelligence by broadcasting to it along with sending to these other things or IP based speakers. There are 10 manufacturers using our protocol in the firmware of their speakers. And those give you the ability to meet a whole variety of needs. They, they can be um, weatherproof. They can be, uh, they, many of them have displays so they can scroll the text of your message across there on an LED or LCD screen, depending on the model and, and the manufacturer. When they're not broadcasting that message, they can be a clock. So we see these heavily deployed in school environments where they're really satisfying four major needs then. They're your bell system, your clock, your paging or intercom system, and your emergency mass notification system. Uh, and what we always say is we'll never tell you to rip and replace a working analog paging system, but if you have 
a green field deployment. You're, you've built a new school or a new hospital. It's a great place for, for, for that. Or if you have places that you don't have good coverage. So you, you do a site survey and you determine that in the hallways, it's not that great. People can't hear you. Or in a gymnasium, a cafeteria, um, the ball field, et cetera. If you wanna add or extend um, the capability in audio, uh, is a great way to do it. All right, so moving along. When you bring it all together, so we talked about what you can send to, both from a mobile perspective and from an Informicast Fusion perspective. Here we see the inbound side of things. So there are two main ways of triggering, manual and automated. And manual is just like it sounds. You can hit a button on a desk phone. You can use an app, the mobile app to send. Uh, you can use Command Center, which is uh, which I'll show a screenshot of in a moment, uh, which is a web-based console to send. Uh, and you can send from, from physical panic buttons. You can send from virtual panic buttons as well. Um, and so then when you look at the automated ways of triggering, a lot of these, they, they're usually use case specific. So weather, um, drawing directly from the National Weather Service, putting a filter on that so you're getting the events that you care about. You probably don't want to send an emergency notification for fog, um, but you probably do for tornadoes. Um, when 911 is dialed, you want to know about that. Physical security systems are tripped and so forth. Um, we work with a number of gunshot detection manufacturers and for our friends on the, and customers on the West Coast, we have early earthquake detection. So those are automated ways tying into systems and sensors. So there's no human intervention involved. And you can have that message go to a human for, for analysis and processing before they then send out an alert. Or for certain use cases, you might want to have that just automatically send the mass notification to everyone in that affected area, maybe by, on a building by building basis. The content that you send, just like with any system, the content that you send is entirely your own. So we give you templates um, that you can start with, but you can modify those to, to really uh, fit your particular needs. This is a screenshot of Command Center. And you know, I'm showing you a screenshot, but I should say that one of the things we would love you to do is to see a demonstration of the product in action, which I'm not doing today. I'm just showing slides of the product and talking to some of the things that, that we can interface with. But we encourage you, if you're at all interested in exploring this, we can do a live demonstration over video and we can show, I'll go back for a moment, we can show all of these things lighting up. We can show the desk phones broadcasting. We can show the digital signage being repainted with the emergency message. And we can show it broadcasting out of speakers. We can even show tying into the defibrillator cabinet. So when that is open, security gets an alert. Um, because if someone opens the, the AED cabinet, there's a pretty good chance that they need some serious help uh, and you don't want them to try to handle that on their own. So command center is really a way of making the user experience, the sending experience, very simplified. So you just choose the scenario that you care about. You'll get a pop-up with a handful of questions, however many questions you put in for that scenario. It could be none and then the message just goes. It could be two or three where you're saying, well, which building is this happening in? And um, a little more detail, punch that in, and then the message, it'll give you a chance to review it, and then the message will go. So this is really, again, just trying to abstract this, making it very simple. We also have Command Center on the mobile app. You'll have a way to, to send that. Um, so if you happen to be walking through the parking lot and you see some sort of, of threat evolving, you can send that notification, notify everybody in building and out uh, from the mobile phone. In real time, you'll get the reporting back so you can see what's happening um, and by, by channel, whether that's email, push notifications, SMS, et cetera, um, even those sent into your Microsoft Teams clients. I've mentioned desktop notification, um, really, uh, really a very effective way of getting in touch with people. And, and there are a number of ways to reach the desktop now. We can do it either with the Informicast desktop notifier, or we can use your Microsoft Teams client or your Cisco WebEx Teams client, like you see here. So this is, this is a way of notifying people. It is also, of course, a great place for your incident response team to meet. 
And the reason we say that is if you're working in one of these collaboration tools all day, every day, sending the notification in there makes sense, but it also makes sense to be able to click a button and turn that into the place where the incident response team is meeting. And there you can have in that space within that tool, you'll have all of your incident response team materials pre-staged, things like floor plans, uh, your checklist for that particular type of incident, a link to the video feeds that are relevant and so forth. I talked about budgets and uh, revenues being constrained early on. This is just a snapshot of some of the things that we tie into. So again, leveraging what you already have by putting a software service layer on top of it and form a cast fusion, which is a, a hybrid cloud environment, tying into any of these things that you have. And you might look at this and say, this is a bit overwhelming and it, it's, it is a bit of an eye chart and it's not even all the things that we tie into. But what we're really trying to express here is that we can take those things that you already have and through a simple configuration, not through custom development, you can configure the ability to work with those. So on the inbound side, panic buttons on the outbound side, things like speakers and signage, if you have those in your environment, you can, you can use those, you can tie into those with Informacast and make them part of your mass notification system. Uh, just a quick snapshot at uh, some of the prominent customers in different industries that we work with. Again, 7,000 customers worldwide. We send over 100 million messages a year. We did put together a special uh, page specifically with coronavirus information. It's something that we've been writing about um, since the, the early days, late, the early days for the United States at least, early, early March, late February timeframe and continuing on through today. You don't have to necessarily remember this. If you just go to singlewire.com, there is an orange banner across the front of our website that will take you to this page. Um, so this has a number of different resources, interviews with industry experts, um, a link to a, a post about a message pack that we created that if you're an existing Informacast customer, you can just add that to your system and it gives you templates that are specific to dealing with the, the pandemic. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time on this except to know that if you get a copy of the presentation, you want to follow us on any of these platforms, um, we'll be there for you. And we do offer free trials of the software if you want to get up and running very quickly with that InformaCast mobile um, product, you, you can. Um, we have a 15 day 100 user free trial uh, and we can always bump that up if you, if you need it. Um, and then you can convert that uh, into uh, your your regular mass notification platform without uh, without changing anything. You don't have to. You wouldn't lose any of your configuration or anything. Um, we have a great set of onboarding resources, including a very robust customer success department. Um, those folks really care about the success of our customers and and getting them the full value of the service um, that they're dealing with. Uh, we also have, if you're more of a self service type person, we also have a library of video tutorials that walk you through step-by-step step how to get started. So with that, that concludes the, the main presentation. We'd love to take your questions if you wanna punch those into the, the Q&A panel now. Um, and we'll go ahead and, and, and take some of those. So I see a, a handful here. I'll just start with the first one I see at the top, which is, what are some common mistakes campuses make when implementing a mass notification system? I think there's a, a couple that we see repeated um, too often. Uh, and one of those is that uh, organizations um, don't do as good a job as they could of understanding the full set of needs of, uh, of everyone there. So you know, maybe they got a request from HR that they need remote workforce notification. But they haven't talked to uh, they haven't talked to people responsible for safety. If that's a different part of the company, they haven't necessarily talked to people um, in IT to understand what what different platforms they need to tie in and so forth. Uh, and the reason that matters is because we do walk into environments where they have multiple notification systems and they're using one for one thing and one for another thing, and then you know and, and probably paying much more than they had to because they have multiple contracts and so forth. So just doing a, doing a good requirements gathering before you go out and, and ask about that is, is one. Another one is, is that um, too often people are, are looking at it and um, 
a, a very shortened time horizon. And so they, they start down one path and then realize that they're at a bit of a dead end because they, they, weren't, they weren't really understanding everything that, that they could be dealing with down the road. You know, things like, you know, I use that uh, tying into the defibrillator cabinet, um, tying into the, to the phone system to understand when someone dials 911 and send that to your safety team, tying into your video surveillance and your access control systems to understand when those things are happening. So if you're running your mass notification system as a silo that's not tying into those other things, then you're probably not getting the full value out of it. I see another question here. Uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge for campus campuses sharing emergency communications this year. You know, I think the, the biggest challenge is just all of the uncertainty, right? We see this, uh, I, have a, I have a son in college and it looks like all of his courses this fall will be online, right? So he will be on campus. Um, some of his peers won't. They'll, they'll be um, in their hometowns. Uh, and so I think that that's just one little example of you know, some of the uncertainty that we see out there. Um, and so it's, and that's, that's really why we put this presentation together in the way that we did. And we talk about here's what's happening today, but here's what's happening in the future is you don't want to lose sight of the big picture and the understanding that things will eventually revert back to something closer to what normal was hopefully. And when that happens, you want to have a system that, that grows with you and that can be flexible. Okay, the next question I see is, why is it important for campuses to be able to reach mobile and on-premises devices with mass notifications? So when we talk about effective notifications, we talk about three main things. Speed, fairly obvious, how quickly can that message reach people? Reach, which is a little bit less obvious. This is, this is how close to 100% of your desired population can you reach? And a lot of people take the perspective that, okay, everyone has a mobile phone. Isn't sending to mobile phones enough? And again, it was one of those scenarios where you'd say at first glance, yes, but the, the real answer is no, uh, as you might guess. And the reason being is that there are people to which you owe a duty of care that you don't have their numbers, visitors, contractors, guests, parents, patients, et cetera. You don't have their numbers now, you won't ever have their numbers. Um, you may make an effort to do that, say, you know, like a, when they, they sign in as a guest or something like that, but if they just happen to be walking through your campus or visiting on a short-term basis, they may not. Uh, and, and so how do you reach those people? And the, the, the short answer is you don't on their mobile phone. You need to have in-building notification to supplement it. The other thing is that even for those people for which you have their numbers, there, there's well-documented situations where you won't be able to, to reach them. Phones are in bags or briefcases, turned off on silent because the instructor asked them to be, or you're in a quiet area or whatever the case may be. And so there's been a lot of academic research done on this, and they found that about 80% of the people will be reached on mobile phones of your desired population. So that, that sounds okay, except if it's a really severe event like an active shooter or severe weather scenario, and you're one of the 20% that didn't get the message. So having multi-channel notification where you're sending to lots of different methods, you're gonna be able to reach far closer to 100% of your desired population. So that's reach. So speed, reach, and the last one is intrusiveness. And the reason this matters is because it's not enough for just a text message to appear somewhere, even on someone's phone. In order for that message to be taken very seriously, and the legitimacy of that source to be recognized, audio is important. So where possible, where the devices support it, you wanna have audio because it's intrusive. Go back to the fire alarm example. So to the extent that we can have spoken audio, like pick up the handset, speak, set it down, it goes out, or you know, record it into our app, send, it goes out, and then it plays in, in the ambient environment, that's intrusiveness and that's effective. So speed, reach and intrusiveness are what add to add up to make effective notifications. And so that's really why it's important for campuses to be aware of both mobile and on-premises notifications. So looking here, I don't see any other questions at the moment. 
Okay, I guess I, I do see another one coming in here. I say, um, how do we separate mobile on campus to mobile off campus? That may not be included in online notifications, but all but all are opt-in with cell numbers. Okay, so you have, yeah, so you have a large population, kind of the, the scenario I was explaining with the, the college uh, campus example where some are on campus, some are off. There are a number of ways to do this. Um, not all of them are gonna, are, are gonna, are 100% foolproof because people do move around. One is if you're an IPAWS alerting authority, um, so that's the integrated public alert warning system. Um, Singware is an authorized alerting provider. And if you as an entity have the ability to use iPods, then you can kind of kill two birds with one stone. So one, you can reach people whose cell phone numbers you don't have. And the other is that, um, is that you're only gonna reach people within a certain geographic area. Um, the downside is that you need to be an authorized sender um, uh, a collaborative operating group or COG authorized by FEMA. So not a lot of organizations are going to meet that bar, but if you do and you haven't looked into it, that that's something to look at. You know, all the county emergency management departments have the ability. Um, large universities and hospitals often do as well. Um, so that's, that's one way of that, I mean, that's the silver bullet, but not everyone can take advantage of the silver bullet. The other way is, is, by, doing, uh, is by doing distribution lists. So um, having people opt in um, based on the type of notifications they want to receive. So I am an on-premises um, student or I'm, you know, uh, re you know, attending remotely, that sort of thing. Not as effective because it requires an action to be taken by the person. Um, the other thing that you can do is, um, if they're using the if they're using the app, um, then you can use geolocation because unlike with SMS, where you don't the SMS system does not know where you are, but our app does, and so um, we can't track you, but we can put a geolocation area of what we call an area of interest, a perimeter, and we will only send to people that are in that perimeter. So that's one reason why you might want to think about installing the app on uh, iOS or Android, as opposed to just relying on SMS. All right, I think we have uh, finished with all of the questions. Um, unless we see any last ones pop up here, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll wrap up. I wanna thank you all for attending and, and thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks, Pat. Um... It was a very informative presentation, and um, I'd like to thank the audience members as well for joining us. Um, as a reminder, you'll get an email within the next few days that contains a link to the recording along with a PDF of the slides. Um, again, thanks again for participating, and uh, have a great day.